So some words about Daniel Kahneman, yeah. Uh, so Nobel Prize winner, uh, he's a psychologist, yeah. He's not an economist. Um, and actually he shared his Nobel Prize in economics with Professor Ben Vernon Smith, uh, who is also not from economics, yeah. So now uh, he he's uh, considered being the founder of experimental economics. Um, why, why Kahneman has got his Nobel Prize in economics, actually? Uh, because he made a lot uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the development of the new field, large new field in economics. Yeah? Uh, he uh, tried, he made uh, a lot, to, he made his best yeah, to, uh, contribute, uh, to contribute to the economics with some ideas on how people make their decisions. Uh, so he was developing uh, decision making, uh, the, the psychology of decision making, the psychology of judgment, uh, and also hedonic uh, psychology. And actually, for several years in line, he made uh, uh, the list uh, of uh, Bloomberg uh, most influential people in finance. Uh, maybe you heard or read, yeah, uh, his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yeah, that, that, that is also that was a bestseller for several years in line, uh, and it was translated into many languages actually. Yeah, that that's quite an interesting book. Yeah, that is uh, that is uh, written in a very nice language. Yeah, very easy, uh, very easy to read. So, why behavioral finance is so popular today? So I have several questions. Yeah, have you ever heard about the January effect? January effect? No. Yeah. About the stocks. Um, winner pairs? No, yeah, not yet. Okay, so I will say some words about that. Um, but then uh, we have two different questions. Yeah. So was the traditional finance uh, ready to forecast the dot com bubble? So why the dot-com bubble in 2000s and early 2000s was so significant for the whole world? What do you think about that? What do you know about dot-com bubble? What's that about? Well, when this internet, uh, uh, many startups are coming back, many investments comes to the IT uh, yeah. area. Yes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It grows, 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 and at some point it's crushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, what was the reason? Nobody knows. Uh, nobody knew at that moment. What is the real value of each of the company in the IT sphere? Yeah, um, of all these businesses that were based on the on some internet technologies. Yeah, nobody knew. Uh, and actually, people just made like the others. Yeah. So that was like following following the large number of other investors. Yeah. So some people invested into IT companies and the others followed. Yeah. And finally, the stock prices were growing up uh, for several years. Yeah. So it started actually in 1996. Yeah. And uh, the first talks about that, first talk was uh, very. Um, uh, very vi uh, widespread talk by Alan Greenspan, who was the head of. Yeah, that moment. Yeah, who was uh, talking about? So I'm not sure. The investors make their best in investing into the IT companies. I'm not sure that the companies are not yet overvalued. Yeah, and that was uh, the. It, it was in December 1996. Yeah, and after that, during four years, the bubble was like increasing. Yeah, and only after that. Uh, that was uh, the problem, uh, that was the large crisis of uh, IT sphere. So, and actually conventional finance cannot, could not, uh, could not forecast the real value of, the, of all that companies, yeah, and could not forecast the moment when uh, the bubble will be blown up. So, one more question. We have the same question about the financial turmoil of 2007-2008. Yeah. So again, that was the question about the uh, financial theories. Yeah. So financial theories again uh, failed. Yeah. To make uh, the good forecast for the whole crisis. Yeah. There were some uh, disputes 
uh, disputes among the top uh, managers of uh, investment banks of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and others. Yeah, and some of them were uh, in favor of, so, well, uh, the market is going up, that's okay, so that means that the economy is growing up and so on, yeah. But some of them uh, were, like, uh, against that, yeah. But talking that, uh, okay, so the market is just overheated, yeah, that's it. Uh, so, but again, the financial theory, so the, the theorists, the uh, economists, they, they, they fail to uh, make the proper forecast for that. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I, I don't know, I'll just, I'll say that I'll, I'm dis, I, I would disagree with you on, yeah. the, uh -huh. on the 2008, um, yeah. because I believe uh, there were many people, um, they were aware of that. I mean, that with the, you know, um, you know uh, with the existing financial theories, mm -hmm. you, they could forecast it, but, um, I would say there was an inefficiency uh, mm -hmm. in the market, you know, mm -hmm. considering the fact that, you mm -hmm. know, rating agencies, they didn't do their job properly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if with the conventional you mm -hmm. know, financial theories, mm -hmm. if you go through those, uh, if someone could go through those, all these, um, basically, mortgage backed securities, they mm -hmm. could see that it's all the subprime mortgages, yeah. and they could easily see that all these CDOs and everything yeah. is based mm -hmm. off very poor, so and you could easily forecast that this is a bubble and it could burst very soon. So that's why that some people, uh, you know, back in two thousand five, mm -hmm. they forecasted mm -hmm. this. And that's why that you know they they, they made a really big short on mm -hmm. this whole market. Mm -hmm. So I would say yes, but on the dot com bubble, one hundred percent agree with you. But mm -hmm. on the two thousand eight, I think they could basically forecast it, but. Banks and greedy banks specifically mm -hmm. didn't allow that information mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. simulate mm -hmm. in the market. Yeah. I agree absolutely with you about that. That was that that was probable. Yeah, that they could do that, and actually, yeah, uh, the influence of the banks really were huge at that moment. Yeah, uh, because now we know, yeah, that that the top five companies now are Microsoft, Amazon, and and others. Yeah, but banks banks are not. But at that moment, banks were were on the top of the list. Yeah. So and they had a huge uh, influence on that. Uh, but actually, uh, if we take a look at the research papers, yeah, mm -hmm. that period, we can find that there is a quite a, a hot dispute on that, yeah, whether that's a real bubble or that's like just uh, uh, a very um, un uh, unusual period for the uh, further development of the market, yeah, and that's not about bubble itself, yeah. Yeah, about a subprime mortgage, of course. So there were no so, so much dispute about that. Yeah, but about uh, the capital market. Yeah, about the market of stocks and bonds. So there, it was a really hot dispute on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why, yeah, I don't think that my words so, like disagree <laughs> disagree oh, with right. you. Yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> so. I thought that you were saying that you know the the conventional financial theory they failed to forecast it, but I would say that no. They could forecast that. Mm -hmm. It was it was very they obvious, they yeah. did, they and they did. They didn't reveal that information. But they blocked this whole information to be communicated to the whole world because they knew that it will crash the whole market. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from 2005, mm -hmm. they blocked the whole information mm -hmm. till 2007 and 8, where you know they could see the whole symptoms and say mm -hmm. that we can't do anything mm -hmm. and the market melted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think in 2008 there is a behavioral element, mm -hmm. and the behavioral element has to do not with the ability of the theory to. Why? But it has to do with the fact that um, investors and everybody were, were making so much money, they were not willing to mm -hmm. hear bad news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was not intentionally mm -hmm. uh, 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 created difficult to reach the market, yeah. the information, yes. but it also was psychologically the market was not ready to absorb mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. information, mm -hmm. being a great party of. Yeah, actually, actually the, the, anyway, there are plenty of reasons, yeah, for the 2008 turmoil. Yeah, so w w if we take a look at different uh, sources of information, yeah, in the 2005 and 2006, yeah, we can find absolutely different opinions on that. Yeah, if we take a look, for example, on uh, the um, equity reports of uh, top investment banks, they are absolutely different, and they have the huge intervals, for example, for equity valuation for stocks. 
Yeah, that is also not so usual. So they, oh, sorry, uh, they can be different. Yeah, so we every time have an interval. Yeah, for the valuation, but not so large as we uh, as we could so uh, as we could see before uh, the financial turmoil. Yeah, and of course uh, the behavioral uh, issues. I don't believe behavioral issues uh, are, is the only element, yeah, for uh, pushing the crisis. Of course not, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, if we add the, uh, oh, if we drop the total ration rationality assumption from the financial theories, uh, we can have much more flexibility uh, for the forecasting, to forecast the future, to forecast the bubble, for example. Okay, let, let us go further, okay? A bit. Sorry, just Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, yeah oh, we wanted to listen about January effects. Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about January effects because actual January effects, historical January effect is the very first anomaly that was described uh, in details in the literature, yeah? So that was a seasonal uh, anomaly that was first observed during the Second World War, yeah? In 1942 uh, by the investment banker, not by the researcher, yeah? Uh, Sidney Watchell, who made after that a book, a paper and a book on that. Uh, and what he observed, yeah, he observed that small stocks had outperformed the market in January, especially during the first uh, half of the January, uh, since 1925. So for 17 years in line. Uh, and what is interesting, uh, after that he, he checked uh, whether it, it somehow correlated to the US presidential cycle. Yeah, and it was correlated actually. So it was correlated and the most, the largest January effect uh, was uh, revealed in the third year of the cycle. So, and then uh, not only Sydney Watchell, but the researchers around and the, the researchers in top universities um, they uh, started working on that. So what are the reasons? Yeah, what are the reasons of that January effect? And we can do the same. Yeah, so let us discuss the reasons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think people naturally want to be cautious about their decisions. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is not Can, uh, I can show you the, uh, this chart. Yeah, this is the chart from the uh, from one of the papers in nineties and nineteen nineties. And you can find here. So this is the smallest cap sum. This is the largest. Yeah. What do you mean by small stock? What's the definition of small stock? Uh, small stock means that uh, if we divide all the markets into decils, like we made here, yeah. So um, the, this is the first 10%, the smallest companies that are listed in the markets. Uh, the next 10%, sm uh, so second smallest companies, and so on, yeah. Maybe they are more stable. They are more? More stable. More stable, small, smallest. Yeah. Uh, statistically, usually uh, it's vice versa. Yeah. So statistically, uh, usually the stocks, uh, the price of the stock of the largest companies are more stable. Based on the depends of, of the effect of the presidential uh -huh. uh, election. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. They are not as much affected as mm -hmm. the big ones. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, because polit political issues they are not so significant for the small stocks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so but why even if we take a look on all the periods, yeah, so that there is no uh, difference for the presidential cycle here in this chart, we can see that the largest effect uh, is demonstrated by the smallest stock uh, by the smallest stocks, and then uh, it decreases one by one, decile by decile. Yeah? So why do you believe people? Uh, what uh, why do you believe that the investors were so? eager to invest into the small stocks in the midwinter. What could be the reasons? Maybe because there's little money left after December and that's what they buy. Good point. Yes, something about the vacation, something about Christmas, yes. Yeah, so it should be around that, yeah, because we are talking about first two weeks uh, in the United States, yeah, so right after the vacations, yeah. 
So they may uh, sell their uh, better stocks in December mm -hmm. before the Christmas. So in uh, January they have less money to buy uh, the less stocks, expensive yeah. stocks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good idea. Yeah, but uh, that works mostly for individual investors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if we're talking about the larger companies, about the, for example, funds? Because here we can find the effect not only of the individual investors, yeah, but also about the effect of the institutional investors. What if it is purely the able kind of beginning of year and then you start something new, let's, uh -huh. let's pursue some new strategy and then you obviously look for stocks which are small because mm -hmm, they are mm -hmm. not kind of explored enough. Mm -hmm. so you are ready to take additional risk, yeah, because uh, yeah. that's something new, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe there is nothing financial in here. Maybe just people want to start a new life. Uh -huh. That's why they invest in smaller caps. Uh -huh. <laughs> what do think? What was the first reason they tested? Financial reports. Taxes, actually. They started from taxes, yeah? And yeah, after that, they they decided that, so they, they checked, they verified that taxes cannot explain the whole uh, phenomenon, yeah? And after that, finally, yeah, they ch they've checked several uh, several announcement effects, yeah? So, they, for example, the announcement of uh, dividends in the December that, that sometimes occur, yeah, uh, and so on. But... Uh, Actually, they failed to find one exact financial reason. Uh, and after all, so in when the behavioral finance uh, starts to develop, yeah, that was one of the first ideas. So maybe uh, we can uh, explain this phenomenon, the calendar effects, with some behavioral reasons, yeah. Uh, especially, for example, about the risk things, yeah, about the uh, risk-taking behavior, yeah, or for example, about some specific behavior after the vacations, yeah, that can be like uh, stimulated with the uh, with all these family vacations that are so popular in the United States, yeah, and so on. Yeah, but still, uh, after several decades, the uh, effect. Uh, became lower yeah we can yeah. Uh, so we can find here the, that the lower effect was estimated for uh, early 80s yeah and then it again decreases in uh, late 90s yeah so um, actually it's not so stable historically yeah but you can find how significant it could be yeah and actually, if it could be so significant, that means that, that we could we could make quite a lot of money on that, yeah? Because if we realize that the prices will go up, so we can buy them in December, yeah, and then uh, we can't find any market efficiency or something like that here, yeah? But uh, the, uh, in real life, they failed to find one exact explanation, yeah? Still. So, uh, some words about winner curse, yeah, so winner curse, that's about the auctions, yeah, that's about the auctions with incomplete information. Actually, yeah, to say shortly, yeah, so that means that the winner will tend to overpay every time. So, and there are two different reasons for that. Uh, so, the winner may be cursed in one of two ways. Either uh, the bid exceeds the value of, uh, the real value of, a, of an asset on the auction, yeah, uh, or the value of asset in less than the bidder anticipated. Yeah, two, two different ways. But uh, we can uh, find a lot of evidence for that effect uh, in the large M&A deals, in, in large mergers, for example. Yeah. So uh, if you take a look at the statistics, both on the United States and we made the same research for Russian market, finally uh, on the large M&A deals, uh, with quite high, uh, with a uh, quite high um, number of participants in the deal, so we do demonstrate on average the winner curse. We can find it. So, uh, if we overestimate the value, we end up worse off than than the losers. Yeah. So this is like the rule, and that was the second phenomenon. The second phenomenon that that wasn't explained uh, quite uh, good by the traditional finance. Yeah. Why, I'm sorry, why wouldn't the traditional agency theory explain this? 
uh, because uh, if we apply, for example, just an Meckling ID, yes, yeah, so, uh, with the uh, with the uh, just uh, agency conflict between two different participants, then we can say that that one of the participants should stop uh, when uh, the uh, when the benefit will, would be zero, yeah. Uh, but if so we don't stop... If we think about it in different ways, uh, the principal and the agents, uh -huh. uh, like an M&A deal, mm -hmm. so the agents, like the managers or directors who are yeah, going on with this deal, they basically know that they are overpaying, but they also know that their performance might be evaluated on the yeah, M&A sure. deal mm -hmm. itself, rather than mm -hmm. whether it was expensive or not. Yeah, for not. example, their bo bonuses, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. and whatever it is, and then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. classical agency theory would explain it, or am I just it's it's partially explained, and uh, actually the uh, the winner's curse was described exactly uh, uh, during the period of the development of HSC theory. Yeah, uh, but if we uh, take a look at the uh, at the empirical papers, yeah, uh, we cannot say that it, it, it can be totally explained by, say, for example, the uh, contract structure, yeah, the bonuses, or things like that. So even after controlling for this, we still find some uh, unexplained part? Which it seems to me, yeah, I cannot uh, right now remember the names, yeah, of the authors, but but I can take a look, yeah, so, but uh, I know that the winner's case finally was also, uh, uh, also went to these uh, phenomena, yeah, that were not explained finally with the classical things like agency theory, for example. Okay, one more puzzle, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, like on the basis of the behavioral finance. Uh, maybe you've heard about the uh, paper that was like a very highly cited paper by Richard Roll uh, about orange juice and weather. So that was uh, in the uh, mid-80s uh, in the United States when uh, Richard Roll dis uh, decided to check. So uh, what are the factors uh, that uh, influence the orange juice price? Yeah. So what should be the factors from the first side? Supply yeah, supply demand. But but so uh, if uh, we believe that demand is quite stable, yeah, the yeah then, then the weather look looks like the only factor that should have significant impact on that. Yeah, or maybe some coalitions on the market, of course, can influence the situation. Yeah, but. Uh, if we check just several years in line or uh, quite long range, yeah, so we can control for the coalitions and so on. So, but finally, uh, what what was the uh, interesting finding made by Roll so from this paper that uh, weather is not a significant factor uh, for the price of the oranges futures. So, and actually, he said that uh, there are some other. Uh, rules in the market, uh, some other rules in the market of orange juice futures at, the ver at that very moment, yeah. So, um, that shows, so the R squared was extremely low for the, uh, for the uh, relationship between uh, orange juice and weather, for the orange juice uh, futures price and weather. Um, so, that was just one more phenomenon, yeah, uh, to uh, fall into the uh, uh, to, to, to support somehow the fail of the uh, conventional finance. So, to make a bottom line here, yeah, what should be said? Uh, so, we should say that uh, uh, by the end of the uh, 1990s, actually there were so many evidence of anomalies that are inconsistent with the efficient market theories that, that uh, people, uh, that people in finance, uh, uh, people in finance and academia uh, decided to look uh, for a new explanation. Yeah, either that that are the bad models they used, or maybe that's the problem with the data, or maybe some results were made by chance, or alternatively we can make one more theory. Yeah, maybe the uh, conventional finance uh, theories are invalid by that by that moment. So and also um, uh, it was the second source. So the second source of the uh, of this um, uh, dispute in the academia in finance was about the over and under reaction in the market. Yeah, so uh, people demonstrate uh, quite a lot uh, over and under reaction for different events. Yeah, like IPOs, different uh, uh, dividend announcement, M and A and earnings announcement, and so on. 
and people are very different in their horizons. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, short term of reaction. So people often demonstrate short term of reaction, then the under reaction, and then go back to the over reaction to the to different events. Um, so. Uh, taking them together, yeah, so this uh, anomaly is uh, um, we found evidence for, uh, plus the uh, challenges uh, in the explanation of these over and under reactions in the market. So uh, we, uh, uh, so the, uh, the people in finance in academia said that, okay, so let's try to uh, somehow to explain uh, these these anomalies together with the behavioral issues, and by that moment uh, there were several papers made by uh, Daniel Kahneman and Damas Tversky uh, on the behavioral economics, yeah, uh, and uh, Sheffrin and some uh, Lakonishok and some other professors. They uh, decided to combine, yeah, uh, all these things together uh, to take into account at least several behavioral biases. Uh, to understand so what's going wrong in the uh, traditional finance. So, uh, questions? Maybe some, yeah. Thank you for the question, a really interesting question, uh, because actually sometimes I also think about that, yeah, so for example, we know um, if we go back to some conventional theories like Kepm, yeah, for example, get less price model, everybody knows that Kepm was tested for a million times, yeah, and uh, uh, many uh, people in uh, many people in academia said that it doesn't work, yeah. But anyway, Kepm is the most uh, popular asset pricing model in the world, yeah. Of course, modified Kepm with some modifications and so on. But anyway, yeah, if you ask the practitioners uh, which model you use, and there are plenty of uh, plenty uh, of uh, research on that, yeah. So how many? Uh, what is the proportion of, for example, CFOs, yeah, that apply Kepm? Yeah, they said, of course, we do apply cap. Yeah, so this is like the trade off. Yeah, because anyway, so this is the trade off between, between the simplicity, yeah, between the potential, the probability, how we can can we forecast or not something with the model, yeah, and the final, um, I would say, with the accuracy, yeah, uh, of that uh, thing that was predicted, that was forecasted. Yeah, that is why I, I do believe that actually we need we need and will will need traditional finance, yeah, to make some exact predictions, yeah. But after that, we need to account for behavioral issues as well, because we should realize that some behavioral ideas uh, stand stand behind that, yeah. But do you believe that it will be actually for let's say fifteen years? Uh, you mean behavioral finance? No, no, traditional. Ah, traditional finance. Mm. I think I think that. Um, uh, in uh, several decades, maybe actually, I, I do believe that in the next decade we do uh, will see that um, in the financial models uh, there were some ch there will be some changes of the assumptions. I do believe in that because uh, if you if you take a look in the corporate finance, so this sphere is just closer to me, yeah, and I know I know pretty well the uh, for example the micro model in this sphere, yeah, uh, we can find the papers in which they do drop already the rationality assumption and they change it with some other assumptions, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, with some uh, additional co coefficients, yeah, uh, on how rational people are, mm -hmm. yeah. So for example, they are rational for 60%. Of course, that's like an approximation. What does that mean, rational for 60%? But anyway, so that's just, that, that's just a try, that's just an attempt, yeah, how we can, uh, how we can correct the model. Right, and because the models can be tested 100 times yeah. now or 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and they were true, it was proved. But mm -hmm. maybe after 10 years, 
not very natural. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, for, but um, if we take a look uh, on the historical things, yeah, cap was invented so more than 50 years ago, yeah. Uh, everybody knows, yeah, <laughs> it works not so good, yeah, but <laughs> they still use it, yeah, all the uh, so portfolio managers, for example, yeah. So people in finance are quite conservative, actually, yeah, it takes time <laughs> to make changes. Um, okay, uh, so let us make uh, the second, uh, the second uh, part of our discussion, yeah, so that's about rationality and that's uh, for, that's like the step from the behavioral economics to behavioral finance. Yeah, maybe some uh, things, uh, some experiments uh, uh, should be familiar for you, yeah, but uh, we'll try, yeah, to take a look on ourselves, yeah, a bit. So, uh, I have a question, yeah, the first question, would you like to move every month from one apartment to another, 12, time, 12 times per year? This question only consists for me. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so, so, what is the answer? <laughs> for millions, of course, no. Maybe for US. Uh, maybe so. It was developed in Russia, so for Russians, it also doesn't work. So, of course, usually the answer is no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now imagine no transaction cost for that. Yeah. Imagine you can find a new apartment that is better than previous one for the same price. Yeah. No, 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 this is the most important thing, yeah, so only 12 times uh, in line. <laughs> no, okay, no. So, uh, according to the uh, theories, yeah, so if we do believe that there are no transaction costs, that means that we are irrational, yeah, because if the next one is better, then we should do that, yeah. So, we demonstrate the conservatism bias, yeah, and this is the usual thing, yeah, so because uh, actually people do demonstrate conservatism bias, yeah, because they have some, um, they have some emotions, yeah, some feelings about the apartments, about the, I don't know, quarter they live in, and so on and so on, yeah. But what do we mean with, uh, by saying transaction cost here? Because there are other types of cost here, right? So. Uh, that's why I put dollar. So monetary costs. Yeah, monetary costs. Yeah. Okay. In that case, it's still rational, I think, because it's like when you are a company and you are yeah. buying services from someone, yeah. Yeah. changing from one to another uh, is not always the best. Case. Yeah, we can add also the time cost, for example, here. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do agree with you, absolutely. Yeah, but it's for an individual. That's for an individual, of course. Yeah. To get used to that apartment, how it's. There are other costs, emotional costs, like mm -hmm. schools for your kids, the market that you use. Things to. like that, yeah, yeah. So it's extremely difficult to estimate, of course, the time cost for that, yeah. But if even if uh, we believe in no transaction cost, for example, you don't need to pay for the removement, yeah, for for going to the next apartment with all your uh, luggage and so on. But that, that's still uh, uh, so that's still usually the answer is no, yeah. So <laughs> this is normal thing actually. Of course, uh, so I tried that for for a large audience, yeah, and uh, I do have several answers. Yes, I do. I, I'm ready, yeah, but that's not so frequent, yeah, so that's like the outliers. So, the conservatism bias, yeah, that's a belief perseverance, yeah, just to, to, to give a definition, uh, in which people fail to incorporate new information, yeah, by continuing to hold their prior views, forecasts, feelings, like with apartment things, yeah, and so on. So, for the investments, for the investors, that, that that makes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, significant impact, yeah. Because unwilling uh, to update a view and they hold um, people can uh, hold an investment too long, yeah, for too long period, for example, yeah. Or uh, if we know that there are some uh, significant news about the company, yeah, we should estimate the stock, yeah. We should estimate the fair value of the stock, but if we fail to do that, or we, we are somehow stick emotionally to that stock, for example, that, that can be the case with the uh, inheritance, for example, yeah. Uh, then, again, this is, uh, we do demonstrate the conservatism bias. So, the second experiment is a very famous one, yes. Yeah? Suppose you face a choice between A and B, yes. Yeah? So, in the case of A, there is a guaranteed loss of $745. 
Uh, in case B, we have 25% chance to lose nothing and 75% chance to lose a thousand. Yeah. Uh, so, what should be the answer? Who's in favor of A? Aha. Two? Okay. <laughs> Two hands. Yeah. Who's in favor of B? More. Yes. <laughs> okay. Why B? Why do you like me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The difference is so small, yeah? We can neglect it, yeah? Something like that, yeah? Of course, theoretically, if we apply probability theory, yeah? We'll get that it's 70, uh, 750 versus 745, yeah? So, and it looks like we should take the, the first one, yeah? The guaranteed loss. Uh, but anyway, so we do know that uh, there is a so-called loss version, yeah? People tend to demonstrate loss version. People don't like to lose, yeah? That's a normal thing as well, yes, yeah, so this is uh, the uh, experiment that was demonstrated by Daniel Kahneman for the first time in Harvard, school, uh, in Harvard Business School, and uh, he demonstrated that, okay, so this is the normal thing, yeah, for people to say, I will choose B, yeah. So despite uh, there is a delta in uh, the favor of A. So one more, uh, one more nice experiment, yeah, take a look, uh, so this is, um, the question that you can find, for example, in the book uh, by Daniel Kahneman, yeah? Uh, so it, it is uh, usually called Steven, uh, Steve example. Yeah, so an individual in the United States have been described by, the, uh, by his neighbor as follows. So Steve is very shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, but with very little interest in people or in the world of reality. Make entirely so, he has a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. And then we have a question, is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Is there another answer? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what is more probable? A librarian, maybe. But why librarian? Uh, and because uh, it, uh, yeah, I imagine librarians people uh, mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. so that imagination. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still image. You feel a image, yeah, yeah. Uh, between your stereotype about librarian, yeah, and the description we we face here, yeah. Why we should answer farmer? Yeah, you can be, yeah. But then you can answer, it can be both, yeah? Library and a farmer. But the right answer is a farmer. Yeah. Why? I agree. Because I have never seen any librarian who is shy <laughs> and who is not uh, like to talk. They always need to socialize. Uh -huh. They're always yelling, fight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And uh, what do you think about statistics? What if we apply our knowledge? So, about the uh, librarians and farmers, what do you think? So, which sector is larger in the US? <laughs> For sure, yes. Yeah. So, there are plenty of farmers in the United States and not so many librarians actually. Yes, so that is why, anyway, uh, for, 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 for a question like that, we should every time say, of course, Steve is more likely to be a farmer. Maybe shy, yeah, but a farmer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that like demonstrates a bit of stereotypes. And I have one more uh, nice uh, uh, experiment also developed by Kahneman, yeah, here. Uh, that is called Linda, uh, Linda example, yeah. So Linda is... 31 years old, single, outspoken, very bright, majored in philosophy. Um, she was, uh, during the student years, was deeply concerned with the issues of discrimination and social justice. 
and also participate in, in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And now we need to make a choice. Uh, who, uh, who can she be? So, uh, Linda is an elementary school teacher. Uh, second idea is she is active in the feminist movement. She's a bank teller. She's an insurance salesperson or she's a bank teller also active in the feminist movement. The last one. So why? Why do you like the last one? So the, the most so that, that's a usual thing, yeah, that people usually first say, okay, this is the last one. Yeah. Maybe because she's bright. Uh-huh. She uh understands that she can like provide herself just being the number of the yeah, and we know that she was kind of interested in that, yeah, so in discrimination things and like that. Yeah, so what do you think? So what should be the, maybe there is no one answer, yeah, but we can find, so uh, I think three answers that, that can be good. Mm -hmm. I think the probability of the last version is the smallest yeah. one. Uh -huh. without being the, uh, uh, the te bank teller. Mm -hmm. And the probability of she being the uh, feminist activist only is much higher. Uh, so the least, uh, not maybe the not least, but uh, the smallest probability that she can be is the last <coughs> one. Uh -huh. She could be a um, feminist movement uh, active, active in feminist movement, she could be uh, Sure. And she could be the um, everything else, but mm -hmm. uh, there is the last one. Yeah, the, actually, this is a very good answer. Yes, yeah? so the only uh, the only uh, appropriate thing is the last one. Yeah, because all others are quite so uh, are quite uh, good uh, to describe this person. Yeah, and all of them have uh, all of them have quite high probability. Yeah, if we take a look. Uh, in the whole market, in the whole labor market, yeah, she can be an elementary school teacher, why not? Yeah, she is majored in philosophy, why not? Yeah, so that's quite natural, yeah. Uh, she can be active in the feminist movement, well, it's not so frequent like the elementary school teachers, yeah, but anyway, that's, that's also can be the case. A bank teller, again, why not? Maybe she major in philosophy, that's not so uh, usual for the bank tellers, yeah, but, but anyway, that, that's probable because there are plenty of bank tellers in the world, yeah. Uh, so, uh, that is why, actually, uh, we can say, so the last one is not the best one, yes, yeah? so <laughs> this is a good answer. So usually we call it representativeness bias, yeah, what we just demonstrated using that experiment. So people rely on best fit to determine categories of stereotypes, yeah, to which new information is assigned. So this is the rule how our mind works, yeah, so first of all we need uh, to simplify the choice. Yeah, we need to simplify the choice. That is why we need these stereotypes. But we, at the same time, should be accurate with the stereotypes. Yeah, because sometimes stereotypes push us to the in, into the other direction. Yeah, to the improper direction. Uh, so th I took that picture from the um, uh, from the um, research of one of the uh, Paris universities. Um, so and that was the research that student uh, in one research lab that was made by a student um, about the uh, stereotypes of the um, of the students that that are studied in Paris, uh, but uh, that that came from another countries. Yeah. So that was the stereotype that they've made about the French people. Yeah, eating bread. Wine, cheese, and frogs. So that's that's that that's the stereotype they made. Yeah. So and if we take a look, so frogs are not in the usual menu of the uh, French people uh, for many decades anymore. Yes. Yeah? So, uh, but uh, the stereotype still uh, works like that. Um, okay, now from us to market, yeah, let's make a step toward the finance. So, uh, invest, uh, so which biases are demonstrated by the investors in the market? Overconfidence, yeah, this is the most, um, the most highly cited bias in the research literature uh, in finance. Loss aversion, we, we checked with the gamble. Uh, 
representativeness. Yeah, we demonstrated using the Linda and Steve example. Uh, the uh, investors usually fail to integrate or fail to uh, fastly integrate all the new information. Yeah, and of course, the one more thing is that sentiment can be huge. That means that we can overreact significantly or underreact significantly. Yeah, and that's also usually explained by some uh, behavioral things. All in all, so it all depends on people. Uh, in if we take a look in the uh, asset management sphere, you, in the asset pricing, yeah. It all depends on the investors, yeah. And the investors can be absolutely different. They can be professionals. They can be individuals. So they can demonstrate homogeneous beliefs or not, yeah. And that it will depend on that. Mm -hmm. So usually biases are divided into two large blocks: emotional and cognitive biases, yeah. So um, let's try to distinguish, yeah, between emotional and cognitive biases. What what's that about? Cognitive biases, that's mainly about the information, uh, information processing things, yeah, how our mind works, yeah. Uh, but emotional biases, that's mostly about our uh, internal, intrinsic things, yeah. So, and the most important uh, difference between these two types of biases uh, is that we can uh, somehow amend, correct our cognitive biases, but we can almost not do that with the emotional biases. Yeah. So, so uh, let me make an example. Yes. Yeah? So about the overconfidence. What do you think? So if a person is overconfident, how how can we correct that? Allowing him over to FaceTime Yeah. So usually, yeah, people with uh, with some uh, events in the life. Yeah. So uh, with the age, uh, with the uh, longer experience, yeah, people uh, became not so overconfident. Yeah, this is the first idea. Yeah, we can apply here. That is why, for example, for board of directors, it's better to have a mix of young and uh, old uh, uh, directors sitting on board at the same time. Yeah. So um, one more idea is education. Actually, yeah, overconfidence it can be corrected using education, um, but. Take a look at optimism. Optimism is considered being an emotional bias. Yeah, because that's like our intrinsic uh, feeling, yeah? So to be uh, optimistic about some events, yeah, about the probability of the event and so on. So how can we correct optimism? It can be corrected a bit, yeah? Uh, the first idea is weather. Yeah, if it's sunny, so the optimism goes up anyway, yeah? If it's not, so optimism goes down, yeah? But it's not so manageable, yeah? Uh, so that is why optimism is considered being like an emotional bias, yeah? It's extremely difficult to, uh, to manage it. So, uh, now let us get to the decisions in business, yeah? To the behavioral corporate finance. So, and here we have, we'll start from a question, yeah? Um, what do you think does? CEO usually is uh, totally rational. Usually not, of course. Yeah, he or she, she's a person. Yeah, and that means that uh, she should have some behavioral biases. Yeah, anyway. Um, but then, imagine for a minute that you founded a company, a startup. Yeah, and that you were lucky, and now this, this is a company, and now you want to hire good top managers. Which biases the potential top managers can demonstrate? So, which biases you will be afraid of? For example, from that from that list, yeah, we discussed, yeah, or others. be afraid of that yeah uh, I agree with you but I'm not sure that's irrational yeah because if we uh, if we are uh, like uh, if we don't like risk 
that's quite natural, yeah, that's quite rational because the risk can uh, can give us some uncertainty about the future, yeah, so that means that, okay, maybe that's rational, yeah. Yeah, but I think that the machine means that it's mm -hmm. about loss of version, a lot uh -huh. of people like start Yeah, so loss aversion, yeah, you should be aware of that, of that yeah, especially for example if uh, you as a founder have quite low risk aversion, yeah, you are happy to bear some risks, yeah, mm -hmm. and that, that, that's normal for for an entrepreneur, uh, for an entrepreneur, yeah, so uh, for those guys who uh, founded the startups, yeah. So maybe, yeah, that can be the problem if uh, your potential top manager will be extremely risk averse, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a problem. What else? Optimism. Optimism. Why? That's a good point, yeah. Because if people are too optimistic, mm -hmm. they might not see the forthcoming mm -hmm. dangers. Mm -hmm. And the forthcoming dangers contain the most disadvantages. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And what do you think about overconfidence? Because they are like close to yeah, optimism. Yeah, they are very close. Yeah, actually, uh, I would say that two most top popular biases in the literature are optimism and overconfidence. Yeah, why? Uh, because both of them usually lead to the overinvestment. And actually, that can be a huge problem, especially with the quite young companies. Yeah? Yeah, if you raise money, yeah, if you raise quite a lot of money, if you already feel the luck, yeah, uh, to invest that money and the investment project was uh, successful, yeah, then you can uh, make a lot of overinvestment actually. Uh, moreover, CEOs and CFOs, usually these persons in their nature, they demonstrate optimism and overconfidence, yeah, because uh, it's extremely difficult uh, to imagine, yeah, that people that are in this profession, yeah, how 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 can they go to that to that top, yeah? How can they become uh, become the CFO or CEO if they uh, would not be maybe more risky than the others or more over overconfident than than the others, yeah, than people around, yeah, so. That looks like natural for that profession, yeah, to demonstrate optimism and overconfidence. Yeah, but sometimes it's, it's better when the CEO is optimist and overconfident than the CEO. <laughs> then vice versa, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They always fight, but yeah. overall the company better. Yeah, but uh, here we should distinguish yeah between just confidence and overconfidence. Yeah, mm -hmm. like an optimism also can be excessive. Yeah, so uh, we should be accurate about that anyway. Yeah. So, uh, from the definition, yeah, overconfidence is an emotional bias in which people first overestimate their abilities to reason and they believe in, they, they are smarter than they are, yeah, and they believe that they are more informed than they actually are, yeah, so that's not only about some emotional things, yeah, that's, uh, so the first part is mostly emotional, but the last part is uh, mostly cognitive, yeah, that if they believe that they have more information that, than they do. Uh, so that's actually a mixed bias, yeah, and we can partially uh, manage this bias, yeah, but anyway, it's extremely difficult to do that, yeah. So what do we know about that? Uh, we know that overconfidence bias has two different types, the prediction overconfidence and the certainty overconfidence, yeah. Some CEOs can say, okay, so uh, the outcome will be that one, yeah, a very high one. But the other CEO can say, okay, so I do believe there are two different scenarios, uh, an optimistic and a, uh, and a pessimistic, but the probability is much higher for the optimistic scenario. Yeah? Two different ideas about the overconfidence. Uh, now, uh, the most popular experiment maybe you ha you've heard about, yeah, so-called driving ability experiment. Um, can you say relative to the others sitting in this room, how would you rate yourself as a driver? Above average, average, or below average? Who is in favor of above average as a driver? Uh -huh. I like the best ones. More hands, please, then. <laughs> if, if the best one. <laughs> okay. <Everyone. laughs> okay, average. Uh huh. 
Okay, below average. Uh -huh. So it's almost in line. Yeah. So uh, this audience, this room is almost uh, demonstrate the average. Yes. Yeah? So uh, mostly people are on average. Some are above average. Some are below average. Yeah. But what is interesting, if you take a look, so in the United States, the first question will be every time uh, answered unproportionally. Yeah, so you, uh, when Kahneman made his first experiment uh, in top schools, in top uh, business schools, uh, he found that uh, people are mainly concentrated on the first two answers. Yeah, below average, that, that was extremely unpopular answer. But if we take a look, uh, when we make the same in HSU University, the same experiment, take a look at the last, at the third one. Relative to all others in this room, how would you rate your analytical skills? Yeah. Who would like to, uh, who, who believes that uh, you're above average about your analytical skills? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, who believes that uh, you're on average analytical skills? Okay, and below average? <coughs> average, you mean in this room? Yeah, in this room. Thank you, yeah? Nobody is below average. And this is, this is okay, yeah? For, for guys who study or who are in finance, yeah, and who study in finance, yeah? And the same we can find. So in HSC, we also found the same. If you were asking about analytical skills, if we are asking about the um, for future investment success, yeah, if we are asking about the calculation skills, just arithmetical skills, all of that, yeah, will find the extremely level of overconfidence on average, yeah, for the audience on average. But for the drivers and swimmers, we don't find that, yeah, in contrast to the United States. So, but anyway, what's that about? Yeah, yeah. Mental, it's hard to compare because you cannot measure yeah yeah sure sure yeah but but that's that, that's interesting yeah but, uh, that for uh, that there is so significant cross-cultural difference yeah so in the United States they do demonstrate the uh, extreme overconfidence for driving and swimming skills overconfidence overconfidence yeah on average they are above average <laughs> that is yeah like an interesting thing yeah um I, when I was in Amsterdam and Professor Sheffrin's in class uh, pool, so uh, about drivers, uh, we found that proportion, yeah? This is overconfidence, yeah? Because above average, there are 33, yeah? On average, we have almost 60. If we compare them, yeah, we'll get much more than, uh, much more than uh, 67, yeah? Uh, that can be two thirds, yeah? So on average. So, uh, but that was just, uh, so that depends on the country, that depends on the uh, cultural differences and so on. But anyway, the overconfidence is a very popular behavioral bias for people, yeah? We should be overconfident about something, actually. Uh, most of us hate to think of ourselves as below average in that things that are important for us. Not in everything, yeah, but in some important things. So, um, yeah, uh, overconfidence about ability, yeah, that 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 what you mentioned, yeah. So we are familiar with the overconfidence about knowledge, yeah, but the overconfidence about ability also exists, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, it totally depends on the cultural things, yeah, about the abilities, yeah, but it still exists in. Uh, in absolutely different markets, and it was tested for many times in different countries already. So now go back with to top managers, yeah, with uh, uh, some our um, with the results of our discussion of overconfidence. Yeah, it's obvious from casual observations that top managers matter for the company. Yeah, uh, and actually, why? Uh, what are the reasons? The first reason is that individual managers have their own investment and financing styles, yeah, and they have all their own preferences. And that's okay, that's not the behavioral thing, yeah, that's just absolutely rational thing. Uh, it can be partially uh, shaped by beliefs, yeah, uh, it can be uh, shaped partially by behavioral background, for example, by our roots and families and so on. 
Um, but what I have an example here, yeah, from one uh, how to say paper, yeah. For example, CEOs that use bigger mortgages for their own houses, uh, they also use more leverage in their firms. Mm. Yeah, that demonstrates just the uh, level of risk preference that is constant for a person. Yeah, not for a company, but for a person. Mm. Yeah. This is interesting about, uh, but that's that's okay for the conventional finance as well. Yeah. Then we have the evidence that education and background matter. Yeah. Uh, for example, we know from many papers that certain executive ability characteristics are correlated with firm performance. For example, uh, I put here a small plane. Yeah. So for example, there is a very interesting research that the people that have uh, the pilot license, uh, they uh, usually, uh, they tend to overinvest in the company, uh, in the company they rule, yeah. So the CEOs with the pilot license, they usually demonstrate much, uh, much more frequent than average, they demonstrate the overinvestment in the companies, yeah. That's an interesting thing, yeah, because what does that mean? That's like uh, the level of uh, risk preferences that is extremely difficult to measure, yeah? So what does that mean, pilot license? That's about some, uh, some personal features, yeah, that we are ready to fly, that we are ready to uh, rule, to drive, yeah, uh, and so on. So, but um, the interesting thing is that uh, we cannot measure this significant, uh, this low risk version, yeah, with the traditional theory, yeah. But we can like find a correlation between the, uh, between some personal features, behavioral features, and the uh, outcomes for the company. Okay. And the last, the last block of uh, today's discussion, yeah, I, I would call it a lecture, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the tale about biotech. Uh, so, why biotechnology is interesting? Because in biotechnological sector, actually, the decisions are often more complicated than in other sectors. Why? Why biotech should be considered, like, separately? Because it's about the health of living organisms. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, maybe the technologies are just more complicated. Yeah, than others. Yeah, than other sectors. What else? I don't actually agree. Why? I mean, the health sector it might be even higher. Yeah, but but then then in some uh, technologies, uh, for example, in the say, I don't know, maybe in software technologies, we can find also a lot of uh, complicated decisions. Yeah, but biotech should be and now is like considered separately. Yeah. More ethic issues. Uh, more ethic issues. Yeah, maybe actually. Yeah, I don't think about that, but but, but I, I didn't think about that, but maybe yeah. And your idea was? Uh, it was a mix between. It is the mix between uh -huh. industries, so uh, we should look at them separately, and uh, the plan should be Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, your idea is very close to, to the thing I wanted to say, yeah? Who is the key person in the biotech company? Usually there is a professor, yeah, who is the head of a lab, yeah? Usually in the biotech company we have a professor who is the head of the research lab, yeah? What do you think, how rational they are? They are also human beings. Yeah, the, of course, yeah. Uh, but they are not, uh, moreover, they, they are not the professional CEOs, yeah. They ha usually have no background, background from business schools, yeah. And they don't uh, use the same models for estimations, for example, that usually CEO or CFO use, yeah. That, that is why usually they demonstrate much more behavioral biases, actually. Um, and then I have a question, how to keep them in company? Because professors, the biologists, yeah, they tend to leave, they want to leave a company after they already invented some 
interesting thing, yeah, some technology that they, they were interested in, yeah, they don't want to see a product. They're interested only in the invention, yeah, in the biological sphere. That's it. How to keep them, uh, how, to, how to keep them in a company I to make money? CEO, let them, you know. Uh-huh. High CEO, yeah, high professional CEO. This is the first step, usually, yeah. What else? Allow them to do the job that they love, you know, right? Uh-huh. And bring other business key persons who can take the decision. Yeah, usually, uh, usually they do exactly exactly that thing. So first they start from the professional CEO. Yeah, then they go for for some team that will help, uh, that will facilitate. Yeah, the work of the professor. Yeah, and finally, but they still need a professor. Yeah, working on that exact product because they cannot finalize the whole business process without him. Yeah. So what they do, they make early IPO. Why? Why? No, for the professor to stay in love. Yeah. <laughs> Not go to management. But yeah, because management. because for professors, what is interesting about IPO? Professors ha ha usually have no idea. So how much is the value of all that technologies and mm -hmm. th that business they are working with? Yeah, and only using IPO, CEO and CFO can demonstrate that this is valuable for people. Yeah, that's not just an invention, that's not just an innovation that can be further developed, but it already has a value. And the second reason, actually, much more monetary, yeah, the professors are not so rich usually, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and uh, get some cash from the IPO, yeah, that can help to stay inside, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, that was, uh, this is actually was, uh, um, Mentioned for the first time uh, by Professor Stuart Myers, yeah, who is quite a famous person in finance, uh, when he made his speech in the uh, CFA uh, Institute um, annual meeting, yeah, and he uh, told this tale about biotech. He said, "Okay, so I'm sitting in my office in Silicon Valley, and I'm looking at all these guys, yeah, who are trying to persuade the professors to stay." Yeah, <laughs> and finally, the decisions are much more complicated, and there are much more negotiations around that. Yeah, in behavior, uh, in biotech than in other sectors. So, and finally, even uh, while early IPO helps, but they will anyway do what they want. These are professors. Yeah, they, they are they are just people. Yeah, they are not professionals. And what is important here? Yeah, that. We need to like remember every time that they're just people, yeah, and they want to make something during their lives, yeah, and the lives are finite, yeah, and that means that these professors they have uh, their own beliefs, yeah, and finally we go back that even if we apply the best models, uh, modified CAPMs, the uh, I don't know uh, the best hybrid models we can, yeah. It's extremely difficult for biotechnological companies to say, okay, this is the best time to invest in, yeah? In the, in the biotechnological companies, that's quite an often thing when the decision depends mostly on what the professor can say or what he or she wants to do, yeah? So um, that is why that's just a very, uh, a very uh, usual illustration, yeah, how people matter with the growth of biotechnological sector yeah this is the most uh, this is the sector with the highest growth right now yeah, in the world yeah and uh, actually uh, that means that with every next step people matter more and more okay so here i would like to uh, make a bottom line yeah because about the key ideas we discussed about the key ideas of behavioral finance the most uh, straightforward ideas are the following. Investors are not totally rational, yeah? We need to uh, account for overconfidence, for representativeness and so on. So, uh, to, uh, to find the long list of the behavioral biases, we can just go to, uh, to Wikipedia, actually. Because there, there is a very good, uh, a very good long uh, reading, a long read uh, on the uh, behavioral biases. And actually, uh, there are some. There is a team from one of the top universities who is working on that uh, article in, in in Wikipedia. And now it contains already a hundred business biases, a uh, hundred behavioral biases. 
yeah but we, we, we discussed today the most popular ones yeah like overconfidence representatives and so on markets are not totally efficient yeah there are a lot of reasons for that we, we, we looked for the for several phenomena yeah like winners curse like uh, uh, January effect and other calendar effects and so on and of course managers are not totally rational <clears throat> and actually what I would add here is that managers when they are working with when they're making decisions in the corporation they have around them quite a lot of people for example board of directors yeah and if manager if a CEO is a very powerful yeah then uh, his or her behavioral biases will influence a lot the company yeah while at the same time if the board of directors is powerful compared to CEO then these biases will be mitigated a bit yeah we call this concept usually limited governance limited corporate governance because uh, from one point of view, so uh, board of directors, there are also people, yeah, but there are plenty of people inside, yeah? There are several committees inside and so on. And they can, like, um, compensate each other a bit, yeah? But when the decision is made by CEO exactly or CFO, they are extremely overconfident, they are usually ex excessively optimistic, yeah, and then the decisions can be done uh, irrationally. So that's just the key ideas, yeah? And then uh, I'm ready to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for discussion. Thank you.